Um, okay, so thank you uh, for coming back promptly. Um, so this is about um, being a challenger brand. And uh, just to start off, I did the kind of cliched thing of looking up definition of challenger brand. And it's neither a market leader nor a niche brand categorized by a mindset which sees them have business ambitions beyond the conventional and an, and an intent to bring change to an industry. So I'll ask uh, the panelists to explain about themselves and their companies a little bit more in a moment, but I know enough about all of them to know that they absolutely fit that description. Um, the other point that, as I was thinking about this, occurred to me is that whilst they're not in the overall context of the UK out-of-home market uh, uh, necessarily a big player, within their own territory, within their own environment, within their own format, they are actually dominant players. So I think hopefully in the discussions that kind of juxtaposition about being small in one context but big in another may come through. Last point, please, I don't want this to be me asking questions and, and them answering. So uh, I, I've asked already that they become as conversational and as discursive as possible. Uh, and whilst we'll have some questions, I'm sure at the end, please, please just stick your hand up and I'll make sure that, that we make this a conversation between all of us rather than just those three. Um, so to start, uh, if I can do that, Sam, if I can start with you, you're here in the capacity of a challenger brand. Um, could you just, each of you, and start with you, Sam, just take a moment to explain what your company is, what it does, and, and, what, and how and why it's challenging. Yep. So, yep, so my name's Sam. I'm one of the founders of a media company called Limited Space. Uh, we build and uh, we create and build communication platforms in shopping centres, um, and we're all over the UK. Um, we're an independent business and a very kind of typical entrepreneurial um, story where you risk everything for what you believe in. And um, <clears throat> I'm still here, 15 years on. So that, that's awesome. Um, so within this time frame, we've become very, very specialist in this environment and understanding the audience. Um, I was looking at it in context like definitions of this challenger brand scenario. And... The challenger scenario, obviously, by definition of being a challenger brand, we're not the largest, and so therefore, you know, there are the dominant players, and but there's also just that term of being challenger, and I think us as a business, we do challenge the status quo because our products are quite unique. Um, they're not so unique that they're they're far away from traditional out of home formats, but they are they are unique to the space. Um, <clears throat> And that being that we started in classic, uh, you know, having um, a big portfolio, a broadcast opportunity, which was whereby we put vinyl on lift doors. And that's how we started. And we've got a captive audience, high walk by traffic. Um, that then extended and we started to then wrap the backs of lift shafts. And then that moved on to the digital world. And then we started, um, then we started to put digital screens um, into our network. And... That in itself actually was um, unique because of just the, the sheer nature of how we started digital, which we were taking over empty shop spaces and doing rear projection technology, which is like moons ago. So now, like fast forward to where we are now, and you know, we still, by definition, you know, are challenging the status quo because if we look at some of our digital um, our digital sites, they are they're very unique and and they are unique in context to their features. They are large digital screens that are rolling out across the UK. We're a quarter of the way through on our expansion plan at the moment. Um, but they're unique because they have sounds, they're interactive, some are at eye level, some are suspended, and 30% of the portfolio move. So this creates you know, other um, creative opportunities for brands to be very interactive with the audience. So I think... Being a challenger brand, that, that's kind of like my definition of us as a business. But I also think that, this is my other bit, that I also think that we are um, kind of allies of, in our industry within Out of Home because we are, it's not just about investment into digital screens. It's about investment into understanding this landscape, understanding what consumers are doing and their behavior patterns. It's like the world is changing so quickly. And I think... Um, I think we're going to be moving into an era, an era where it's going to be by definition. And what I mean by that is, you know, we can, you know, communicate to, like, TV budgets and we can, you know, demonstrate how digital and online work together. Um, and I think, you know, 
because that is important to us and that understanding and know-how and investing into different research techniques, just different models, and we're going to go out and champion that, and that's not just to the at-home industry, that's to the media industry. And I think, so I do see ourselves as also yeah, being we'll, allies, working together to grow our industry. Yeah, we'll come back, I I'm going to come back to yeah. collaboration later. Fee, do you want to talk a bit about eight? Yeah, please? so I'm Fiona Ravlick. I'm the National Sales Director at Eight Outdoor, um, a fully digital business large format roadside, and we have been in existence less than three years. I definitely feel like we're a challenger brand. We came into the market with one screen in Leeds, and we've recently gone live on our 100th screen. So definitely feel like it's the right platform for us today to be here. Um, we are very unique in that our business um, has its sister company, SIS Digital, that built all the large format screens for quite a lot of the other media owners in this space. And that's kind of how 8 Outdoor was born. Um, it's a very unique business in that it can do everything from start to finish in terms of building a site, installing a site, selling the advertising. And I think what we've really done is, you know, grown the digital out of home marketplace. When I talk about 100 screens, we are investing and building in towns and cities with little or no digital. So we're really growing the digital out of home market in that respect. Hi, I'm Sarah O'Sullivan, Sales Director of Forest Media. Um, Forest, uh, in terms of challenger brands, we've been going considerably longer, actually, probably than my counterparts on the stage, but we do consider ourselves a challenger brand in terms of the part we play in Scotland and Scottish out of home. Um, we're 60% of the super premium market up there, and in terms of that, I'm talking about backlights, uh, super premium digital D48s as we start to embark on that journey too. Um, we own a lot of the lands that we develop our uh, portfolio on, which has put us in a very good position in terms of being challenging and market leading. Uh, we were the first people to put a digital screen in the ground on top of Central Station um, outside of Piccadilly Circus Lights. So the, the guys were able to deliver that with full motion in 2003. And from that site alone, we have challenged and championed digital out of home on a super premium scale. Um, particularly with that format, we've looked to integrate that into a network. And again, when Samantha was talking about turning things on its head, super premium, so the big giant screens that you're used to seeing that might be bought in isolation <coughs> for location-specific purposes um, or to do something very stunning or impactful on. We've tried to amalgamate that into a network too, so almost like the holy grail of what digital could look like if it delivers on brand fame metrics and giant scale and size, but also in terms of reach and cover of Glasgow and Edinburgh, which we've really worked hard to do uh, to the point where we're second uh, in terms of reach only to television now in Glasgow on this network. Um, and we're very much looking forward to sort of seeing how the industry evolves and moves forward across the rest of the UK. We've been blessed in terms of our size and able to move quickly at speed and at scale. Uh, we have full motion at the side of the road up in Scotland, which again is something that we, we'd love the rest of the country to catch up with so that we can have sort of more intelligent conversations with creatives around full motion and, and those capabilities and, and things we can do in tandem with other media. So it's been a very exciting time for Forrest. The growth in terms of digital has been tremendous. We very much see our business moving more and more forward towards that, that model as we convert some of our backlight stock towards digital. Um, so that's where we are as a business, but, but very at the forefront of, so, of wanting to embrace this. Thank you. So if I can pick up on that. So from what you've said and, and from what I know, your, um, this might be a bit of a generalisation, but your businesses see the future growth and future success very much predicated on becoming more and more or exclusively a digital company. I think, yeah. So just picking up if it, on what the, 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 the dialogue we have with Justin, do you think, you know, there are some people in the industry, and I understand why, and Justin explained it very eloquently, why people love paper. Do you find, you know, is, is your experience that that is a hindrance either to your own business? Do you, do you think, uh, as Justin suggested, that they're, they remain good bedfellows, classic and digital? Um, or, or do you think that actually there's some planning and buying that perhaps is being slightly Luddite in its outlook and that there should be a greater embracing of digital? I think um, if you think of traditional out of home, I like to use analogies, and I always think of it as a... Uh, it was almost like a bread life. You knew what you got with traditional out of home. You knew exactly what it would deliver. It would deliver on cover, frequency, fame. It would get your message out very, very quickly in a full broadcast medium for above the line broadcast um, metrics and delivers continually well against that, that basic requirement. With uh, digital out of home, um, 
I think, you know, from my personal perspective, it can still do that, very much so. Uh, but it can do a plethora of other things as well. So it's almost like a Swiss army knife. It can answer so many different uh, marketing objectives, things that us as the traditional pack shop medium would never be able to deliver on. So where we were showing that photograph of a Hoover, and there it is, pack shop, that's exactly what it does and says on the tin, we can now show that moving. We can show how people can integrate that and use it and have some fun with that. And, and as motion develops particularly, I think that will open up a whole new level of possibility in terms of what we can do when out of home. Um, again, one of the things I, I'm, I'm interested in is headline and where people put the modern day headline uh, these days and, and that digital lends itself to that tremendously. I mean, obviously we saw the royal engagement only a few weeks ago and I think 20 years ago, most of us would have arrived, in, those of us who live in London, who would have arrived at our desks would have known about that engagement um, from reading it on a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there were people still knocking around London at six o'clock that particular day that didn't know that that engagement had happened. But using headlines through uh, digital out of home, and as that translates to critical mass, and it's everywhere and it explodes, we could be the go-to medium for, for headlines and newsworthy uh, current affairs and, and interest and, and, so, and taking another, sorry. another control. Sorry. Fever, so in your conversations, uh, do you find the, I can just get cheap mass cover on paper is, is that something you come up against often yes but i suppose we're different in that we are 100 percent digital and all we talk about and and pitch is the benefits of using digital out of home i think it's very difficult to compare like for like because they're two very different mediums and obviously i'm going to talk about digital all day long because that's what our business is but I think the capabilities of digital and being able to be contextual and run dynamic copy um, is a really exciting thing to be able to offer clients. And the capacity to be flexible, to go live, like Sarah said, one day around the engagement and we'll probably have one day campaigns for the Royal Wedding. I think that's really exciting. So I think that we will always talk about the benefits and, and the beauty of digital around flexibility and its capabilities. Do you find that uh, planners and buyers are moving away from a two-week mentality? Yes. More For us, they are, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Sam, do you have any views on the so, plastic yeah. versus digital? I do, and I think that's more so because kind of like my business is, you know, it's different. It's not in Rayside. We are, you know, we're in a kind of a captive, we've got a captive audience. We're in shopping centres, and shopping centres are changing so much. You know, it's shopping... And I think that's, that's changing from society as well, just, you know, safety and things like that. I think they're creating spaces that are really about lifestyle. That they're not, you know, they're not... We, we know this, I mean, this argument's been going on for ages. It's not just about shopping. But it's really not just about shopping anymore. And I think... Uh, so, therefore, I think, in context to our position, it's slightly different because we're looking at how humans or how consumers are moving and how they conduct their journey in, in, in these spaces. And so therefore, um, digital is very, very important. And it's, you know, it, it's on the top of our agenda and priority in our development, just because what it can do and how it can be reactive and, uh, you know, and just real-time messaging, so many things connecting with, the phone, with smartphones. You know, there's just so much we can do. Um, but at the same time, there are some you know, prime spaces that just lend themselves very well to a classic execution. And I think now we have a really nice marriage between physical and digital spaces. And I think if I look at our estate and our classic, if I look particularly like the lifts, you know, there's no rocket science, it's final lift door. But by location, where they are situated in those spaces, it's like, you know, you, you can't miss them. So they're a really nice touch point. And there are clients that still want that. You know, we're still seeing you know, you know, big luxury brands, and they're booking their Christmas in you know in January. They know exactly what sites they want. They're picking out the banner locations and their classic sites. And uh, so I still think there is, I still think there is a market, there is a place for classic. Uh, and I don't think that's going to go away overnight. I think obviously digital is going to be the front runner on growth. Um, and I think this is all going to be, I think, evolution, natural. It's just going to be evolution, natural evolution. And I guess just picking again up on, on a point that was made earlier, um, and, and you mentioned it there, is that I, I, my, my observation and from a couple of things this morning is that, is that because it's digital, people have tended for the last couple of years to look at what it's capable of. But so you mentioned it's actually still just a mass reach poster. Um, 
you know, I, I just think that, the, you know, and maybe you can ex have, give me your thoughts. Are people using the capabilities of digital medium, uh, the digital out-of-home medium, as well as they should? And by that, I mean not only in planning terms, but also creatively. I think a, B, do you want to talk about that, maybe? Yeah, I think um, flexibility is a, a, a big buzzword for us. We um, went to the market last year, and we launched A365. We actually went out and said... There's not 26 in-charge dates this year. There's 365. You can go live when you want, when you want, when, with what you want. So I think that flexibility is obviously really important when you're pitching for digital out-of-home. Um, and also, I think there's obviously the capabilities of digital as well. 75% of the business we take at A Outdoor is um, less than a two-week campaign. So we do lots of one day, two days, two-hour types of campaigns. We've also recently... Um, launched a new buying model, Lighter for Longer, where you run an advert every other minute for four weeks rather than an advert every minute for two weeks. So there's lots of ways that you can package it up, but I think being flexible around planning is key, especially when you're pitching a product that is there to be flexible. Yeah. Do you feel the same, Sarah? Yeah, I think, you know, flexibility is, up, is yeah. key. Um, I think there's a lot we can do and there's a lot we can talk to our clients mm -hmm. about about clever ways of using out of home per se. I mean, if we think back again to the press model 20 years ago, you'd have somebody like BMW buying a double page color spread to advertise the latest car in, in range. And then at the back side of the paper, you would have on a more localized level, the dealerships and the price promotions going on around BMW in those areas. It's a really simplistic example of a, of a newspaper back in the day doing two different jobs. Uh, and I think in terms of how we grow our industry and the conversations we have with our clients is that we're always key to remind them of the solid background that out of home comes from and what it does on repeat 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 and building brands and, and making people fall in love with brands long before they're ready to buy them in many cases but also what we can do is have other conversations in other marketing arenas so sales promotion competition led this type of thing budgets that we as an industry haven't traditionally had our hands on we need to open up those conversations and say do you know what guess what we can do this as well and this and this and this as well as this and aren't we great um, so I think there's, there's so much conversation to be had and so much education to be done across the industry in terms of what we can achieve uh, now and what's possible. Yeah, and you say across the industry, I was going to ask, when you talk about education and, and, and you know, bringing those opportunities to life, if, if there is a... So I guess, where should that education most importantly lie? Um, I, I think, you know, Frank's here, and I won't put you on the spot, Frank, but I think specialists are pretty aware of the capabilities I mean you may want to comment Frank if you don't mind where, where do you think the blockage is I mean why isn't more use being made of the digital mediums capabilities I think with the media owners you know um, hundreds of millions of pounds over the last few years have been invested into digital and yet this year the medium will grow maybe one and a half to two percent which clearly if you're a media owner uh, and you invested so much money is not good enough in terms of growth Obviously, if you look at what's happening in other traditional channels like TV, it'll probably be zero growth this year. Press minus 18.5%, radio pretty flat. The only business that's still growing, without all the, even with all the controversy, is online, Facebook, yeah. Google, etc. So I think for the media owners, uh, as well as us, I mean, Talon have got a roadshow going on this week in Birmingham, Manchester, Newcastle, Edinburgh, etc. It's an education for regional agencies, creative agencies, clients, because it was interesting yesterday, we was in Birmingham talking to some agencies who had come down and some clients. They still thought that for digital out of home, you had to have the same ad running on a multiple of sites. Not as we've just been talking yeah. about there, contextually yeah. relevant, creative, um, working at different times of the day to suit an advertiser. So education for creative agencies, agencies about how the medium and how effective the medium is. And uh, at the moment, we're either looking down or up, aren't we? We're either looking down at our phones, like some people probably in this room now as I'm talking, or looking up. And I think out of home and social have a real good... Uh, network, to, uh, a good combination to work together, and that's something we're working on at the moment as a business. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Sam, do you, do you, what would your version of that be? I mean, are you focusing more on creative agencies, on planners, than specialists maybe in the past? I think everything in, in equal measures, because how I kind of like view the marketplace is I kind of like really see, um, you know, specialists are, you know, a, a kind of 
partners, you know, you're working because, you know, we're the, in we're the industry, we're the out of home industry, and we need to be going and, you know, educating, as you're saying, to the ad agencies, to clients, and to creative agencies. So I think actually all in equal measures is incredibly important. Um, and I think, yeah, just educate. Again, I'm going to go back to evolution. I think it's all coming. It all comes, it all finds it right, its right time. And I think as more and more, um, you know, plans and, and campaigns start using the flexibility, um, we're going to see a lot more of it. So I just think, you know, in 12 months' time, it's going to be different again. So I just think it's an evolution, and I do think education is not yeah. just at one okay. point. It's across the board. And, and so just picking up on, on the point Frank made, I mean, I, I personally, I think that the digital out-of-home medium, if we can separate it, is a little bit unfairly treated when it's bracketed with a 1.5%. So the investment that's gone into digital has actually generated a 22% increase year on year. So I think the, the issues are with the, with the classic. And I think in a personal observation, I think you know, if they were two separate medium, you'd be saying digital out of home is doing really well and paper out of home is doing really badly. To, to amalgamate them is a little bit unfair, but let, let's bear with that. Um, what, what is the view uh, from, from you on the panel as to what could be done, what should be done, uh, and I, I guess I'm veering back into the area we talked earlier about collaboration. Is it is it genuinely something that people are ever going to do? What do you think could be done to accelerate the growth in in terms of getting revenue out of other media or, or using digital more? Um, you know, what's your view? I mean, obviously there, there will be a view from the big guys, but as, as relatively smaller challenger brands, as we said, what's your view on what could and should be done? I personally think it's all description and by definition because I think we can speak in one language which is to our industry and then we can you know, take exactly the same proposition but we can just use different languages and then communicate to like, different budgets. And I think due to the flexibility and the width and breadth of digital, you know, we can do that and I think we can, you know, we can, we can evolve quite quickly. And I think, you know, case studies, looking at this marriage of, you know, of kind of like the social side of it, what you were just saying, Frank, you know, looking at that, how is it working without home? Because there was a recent, uh, I saw an article a couple of weeks ago in Campaign, I think it was YouTube, and they were um, showing a 20% increase in effectiveness, and it was TV and online. But then by definition, kind of with, you know, with, with digital out of home, you know, it could be considered as TV. So when you put the two together, I think we need more case studies to show the effectiveness of what this is doing because it's going to do something. Because I think online, we know what's happening. It's like you can you can get lot. It's like a needle in a haystack. And I think this I think is I think is a really exciting time for digital out of home because you can really own some pretty impressive space and make a huge impact. And then that connecting with the online and the whole you know the multimedia. Uh, plan, then we're really going to start seeing driving results because we've got to go back to the original objective and it's to sell product, promote service, the businesses and we have responsibility to create effective communication platforms so we can sell product, promote a service for our clients and I, I kind of have to keep telling myself that's what we're trying to do here. So if we can demonstrate really, really good case studies that this is how it works, we're going to win, we're going to grow. Any thoughts on collaboration? And yeah, I think collaboration is, is key. And it's something that we've been talking to the specialists a lot about, I suppose, an education as well. It's little things like, of course, you can change your creative on digital out of home. But a lot of people, like you just said, Frank, didn't realise that. We, get, we always try to encourage people to change their creative because they can. And it's what we're able to do. But I definitely think there's a need for collaboration across the media owners in this space to go out and talk about the benefits of digital and, and really what's possible because some of the greatest digital app home campaigns get the most PR and, yeah. and are really exciting. I mean, you know, saw Hiscox earlier this year. They did a brilliant campaign, um, Talon and Good Stuff, around that campaign, and it was literally everywhere. And, you know, it gets really exciting and gets loads of momentum, and I think that's what digital, you know, that's when it's at its best. Sarah? Yeah, I think the, uh, the celebration of good work across the industry is something that needs to be evangelised about every day. Um, all the media owners have got a plethora of examples now of, of digital working and working well. Um, I think we can talk together about that. We can go out en masse about that. And we're all agreed in the room that that's a success, uh, it's a success story and it's delivering time and time again. And the more we all talk about that, the, the, the better for the growth um, of, of the market per se. Um, 
I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to talk more. Uh, it's a shame that Outsmart was curtailed somewhat, and I think that there is a need for us to think again about that uh, and to think how we can work again at something that encompasses all players, that we're, we're showing a sort of strong, united front, that we are, we are confident in our medium and that it delivers. I think that's something that potentially we should be, be looking to again. Um, but the willing is there. We're seeing good work. We have award ceremonies that are showing good work. We just need to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, yeah. keep doing it. <coughs> if so I'm, I'm sorry, if I may, I'm going to t Tim and Mungo as well. You, you're involved. There actually is quite a lot of collaboration across the industry on more functional things. That's fair. It seems to me that the, that the, the marketing and the, you know, the probably the most important thing for our client customers awareness of what the, the digital medium can do is is less because you have subcommittees on planning and tech, all those, yeah? Do you, do you want to just, I mean, does it work? It works well? Competitive media owners work together? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so from uh, my perspective, <clears throat> we have a, a committee called the Standards Committee, and actually it's a committee that crosses both media owners and uh, the specialists. And that's a committee that we've had going for a couple of years, and uh, it's been an interesting journey because I think that what you start off with is a number of companies who are using, I guess, technology and some of the changes to create for themselves a commercial and competitive advantage. And as that technology uh, matures and as it broadens out into more companies, they see that actually it's less about the competitive advantage for themselves and there is a greater requirement for a bit more collaboration and joined up thinking in the way that the market is being approached, the broader advertising market is being approached. And uh, that just needs a bit of a journey. That's a bit of a, uh, a time and a bit of um, uh, making people feel comfortable with that level of uh, collaboration and therefore making changes to their own systems, their own way of selling, their own way of approaching the market, which is perhaps in line with the rest of their competitors. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's always worth remembering that um, out-of-home advertising has worked really well in the UK for many years because we all sell 48 sheets and six sheets. We collaborate on the size. So there's lots of other stuff that's been introduced, but there are common denominators that have helped to yeah. make it easier and sell the same story. Um, and so I think we're learning how to do that with, with digital at the moment. Thank you. Does anyone else, while we, we're going, anyone else have any thoughts on that? Neil? Any thoughts on... Make it the other side of the room so I can run yeah, I'd like to see you in action. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do, I do, while we're just talking about it, because I think it is an important area, not only for challenger brands, but for the whole industry. If, any, you know, just as I say, if, there's, yeah, someone... I come from the advertising and I'm, my issue with all these sort of things and I'm trying to preach digital out of home in my creative team and I've got two issues really is the media by the agency that give me a, a classic if you want uh, media buying which is normal stuff if I try to do anything that's exciting I usually get the media buying late and it's too late to do anything best book and my creative team, which are you know, in their 20s, their 30s, they don't realize what you can do with it. So not only the clients go, you know, I'm going, you know, example, I've got one of your uh, limited space, a part of one of my media plans, going, oh, look, that's a new format. Maybe we should do something with it. And the creative look at it and well, I don't know what to do with it. And then yeah. it's just get passed over. And they can go, oh, well, it's the matter. We'll do something next time. So it's, the education really is on the creative team themselves. Yeah. And you've got the agency that want to protect that because you know, we're not going to give the idea to the media owner because they're going to go straight to the client and go, oh, we can do that with our stuff. So there's that issue as well where creative agencies are really protective. And if I don't educate my creative team, nothing's going to come out of it. So the education is not only with the client, but it's actually inside the creative team themselves to think before we have a media plan to go, I know limited space, do some cool stuff. I'm going to you know, lean on media com and tell them, book with this guy because they also made mean, something great, which sadly doesn't happen. It's always the classic media plan. And I think that's another issue that I have to bring digital out of yeah, I'm, I'm inside gonna, me. 
I'm going to ask Fiona to speak because I know Fiona, when you worked at uh, on Samsung business, you you kind of you bridged that kind of whole creative and media area. Do, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I I mean I agree very much with what Frank said, but. Um, through the business now, through my company, Diversify Media, what we specifically do, because um, it's a bugbear from years before, is um, Chale Media, which we created, which is an offshoot of Samsung, and it's within their creative agency. But Chale Media was physically, as well as in process, immersed in the whole creative procedure. Now, that was also a huge frustration that you were talking about. So very much, you and still have, so I still work with a lot of creative agencies now, there is a huge appetite within the creative agencies to do different, to be innovative, and on scale. Most of them, they don't know the capabilities. They don't know they can contextualize, as you were saying, which is absolutely right. One of the frustrations I had in my Samsung days is um, not all, but some of the media owners would come in and talk to us. They also didn't know the capabilities of their own networks which was really difficult because often I would get the creative teams in to talk about what we could do, and it was just, I don't know. But one of the issues that I work with a lot now is that the, is bridging the gap between creative and media planning because very often, not only are the creatives, they are, they are doing their artwork on a screen, which is not how out of home is viewed, whether it's elevated, how big it is, where it is, traffic, etc. And all that needs to be taken into account. But very often they would be given a plan after it was bought and said, here it is. And you go, well, what are we going to do with that? Yeah. So it's actually, as well as talking to our creative teams, within the creative agency, we need to talk to the account teams who are the coordinators between the media buying and the creative and get it there. That's where we'll change things. I'm, I'm hesitating to do this because I know he might go up and walk around the room, but is Barry still here? No? No, he's gone. Okay, I was just going to ask him because I, I don't know if he has creative agency members. I just wonder what their perspective is. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? I could, I could speak on behalf of Barry. Just Sorry. <laughs> I could speak on behalf of Barry. He and I talk about this a lot, um, but I'll speak on behalf of Please himself. Do, yeah. So it's Stephanie Gutnick from Broadsign. I think the topic in general is very interesting because I quite view out of home as a challenger brand in itself. Like our industry is up against much bigger channels per Barry's presentation this morning. There's a lot of money being spent on... Uh, digital and mobile, and um, at a certain point that starts to yield diminishing marginal returns. Uh, and so to, you know, the few comments that were made prior to my own is uh, we definitely, it's on us. We cannot say that it's the agency's faults, uh, regardless of the silos and their lack of communication between the planners and creative and so on. It's really up to out of home. Um, the tech vendors, such as Broadsign and Hivestack, um, as well as the media owners, to be everywhere. And let's use the current situation to our advantage. Uh, agencies are in peril. The holding company model is starting to question itself. Consultancies are starting to build wonderful kind of connected approaches to media and to communication. And so why don't we look at ourselves as a challenger industry and start attacking where there are faults and where there are opportunities. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Um, we've just got a few minutes left and um, with three ladies on the panel, and I, I appreciate gender is only one form of diversity, but with a broadly white male middle-class, middle-aged audience. I think it's just worth asking, the, and, and this again, this might be a, something that's rather different at big companies than challenger brands. Um, the point of view on the diversity in the medium and, and, and where we are, are we in a good place or less so? Fee, I know you're, you're involved with Wackle and you do, I know, the, late, the female breakfast. Do you want to talk a little bit about your thoughts and views on that? Yes, I'd love to, actually. Um, if anyone here knows me, I've been championing diversity since I started at 8 Outdoor. I think the business, because it's such a young business, we've been able to kind of take the diversity uh, agenda and run with it. I run a monthly breakfast every uh, month for women in the media and out-of-home industry to have access to a female role model. I think this is progress, having three women on a panel at an event like this. I felt like that was progress 
anyway. Um, Kinetic have recently launched a diversity committee called Balance, where the idea is that the specialists and the media owners in this space come together, collaborate, which we've talked a lot about today, and try and tackle the issue of diversity. So, yes, I think there's, in, there's been improvements, but there's a long way to go. Sarah? Do you I think, um, feel the same? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a way to go, but I think progress is being made. You know, when I'm out and about on my travels, media agencies and specialists, and I see a lot of female faces, and, that, and that's fantastic. I think, you know, actually as an industry, we're probably better than some others. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, as, as, as digital evolves and, and the way our market evolves, I think, you know, the, the, the industry will change and we'll start to see that level out over time. I think we're well on the way, on the journey. Is that um, your expert over the... You've had slightly longer history, so is that, have you seen that same progress? Yeah I, yeah, I do agree. I do agree. I think there is, yeah, definitely progress. I, and I also think it's quite interesting, like, looking at, um, like, we've just been doing, like, a, an intern program and seeing, you know, just the number of applicants are coming forward. And, you know, I'm, obviously, I'm pro, I'm, it's just really about quality. It's just, you know, we're all human and if we look at, like, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's like, you know, we all got to, like, work and earn money and put food on our table and get, you know, like there's some basics here and I just think it's about equality and it shouldn't really be about gender, that's my view. And I think what's really nice within the industry is we, I think it is attracting um, some really great talent and I, I've met some awesome, like these um, young ladies coming out of like uni and, and I, there's one woman who came in a few weeks ago and she's joining us in the summer and just her articulation of um, audience and how humans are changing and what we can do and I was blown away and I just think that I just think as evolution as you're saying I think is it's happening and I think it's you know it's just just to keep encouraging it you know and I, I, I'm just all about just equality I like equality it's all good yeah equality to include slightly older grey haired gentlemen as well obviously <laughs> um, does anyone else have any thoughts or questions from the audience I think we're kind of we've, we're coming up to our time so if there's any other points we want to pick up on or raise separately no nope. we've had quite a lot of involvement so Done very well. okay so um, thank you to the three panellists and thank you also to those of you who contributed from the audience in the discussion thanks very much <laughs>